Hackney Church. It is wonderful to see you and a special welcome for those of you tuning in today for the first time. We're really pleased that you are here and we want you to know you are welcome. We hope you feel right at home here on Hackney Church everywhere. Not long after my family and I moved to Hackney, we threw a lunch party after the morning service. There was a service at 11 o'clock in those days, and we had about 50 or 100 people attending church in those days. So it was, it was like a small enough to be able to all eat together in a big, long table. And we set up this massive, long table at the back of church, and everyone brought their favorite dish. And I've got to tell you, it was the most delicious lunch because everyone brought who they are to the table. They brought their own flavor, their tradition. We had Jamaican patty. We had curry goat. We had quiche from M&S. We had pizza from Italy. We had Italian food, Indian food, African food, English food, Caribbean food. We had jollof rice from Nigeria. And then we had jollof rice from Ghana. And then I discovered there's a big conversation in the world about which jollof rice is the real jollof rice, the proper jollof rice. I'm not expecting you to email me with the answer. Listen, when we get to heaven, one of the first things I'm going to ask Jesus is, Lord, which jollof rice is the right one, Nigerian or Ghanaian? And let the Lord decide and we'll take whatever he says. But the point is this, I have never eaten so well as I did at lunch that day. Far more interesting than my normal lunch. Why? Because there's something deeply powerful and precious about being part of a diverse family. When you bring your flavor to the table, it creates something far greater than if we just stayed in our own little bubbles. Today, I want to speak to you about the prophetic power of a diverse church. Over the past few weeks, we've been in this series unpacking and reflecting the Imago Dei, the image of God, how we are all made in the image of God equal by a God who sees us and knows us, who created us each in his own likeness. We've looked at the brokenness of the world, of what happens when, rather than seeing each other as made in God's image, we make God in our image and we reduce each other to being defined by difference. We've looked at how that leads to the evils of systemic and racial injustice. And as a church community, we have taken time to unpack this in our connect groups, in conversations online. We've talked about it together. We've asked what it means to see each other and to hear our stories. We've prayed and protested. We've stood together to say that black lives really do matter. We've mourned over the deaths of Armand Arbery, of Breonna Taylor, of George Floyd. Last weekend, we remember the 72 precious people who lost their lives three years ago at Grenfell. We've grieved how COVID-19 has disproportionately affected those of ethnic minorities here in our community. And while I know this will have been tiring at times, especially for those in our family for whom this is a daily struggle, I want you to know that I've never been prouder to be part of Hackney Church. Thank you for leaning in. Thank you for doing the work. Thank you for dignifying each other by taking time to think this through. And I want you to know this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end of a collection of talks. What I hope and pray is that in the years ahead, As a church, we will have this conversation right at the center of our relationships. There won't be something we're embarrassed to talk about, but actually we create space to dignify each other and our differences by acknowledging them and in love and responsibly talking them through and creating space to honor one another. That's really my prayer. I believe this is a sea change, not a season. And as we begin, I want to just for a moment share some of the personal stuff that I've been trying to do in reflection of the Imago Dei stuff we've looked at. You know, I've really felt the Holy Spirit speak to me since we began this series, and I've been trying to do four things. Firstly, I've been trying to reflect, to listen, to take time to speak with friends, to read, to let my heart listen to what the Holy Spirit has been saying. I'm so grateful to be part of this community that has some extraordinary leaders who have been bravely speaking into this from the experience of being people of color. I really want to honor them publicly today because they've been teaching me so much about what it means to pursue racial justice over the past few years. But in the last few weeks, they've been brave and they've shared online, on Happy Church everywhere, on Instagram, 
They've shared their thoughts and that has been costly to them. So I want us to just take a moment to honor them and thank them wherever we are right now. The second thing I'm trying to do is repent. Repent of my own failure, my sinfulness, my own prejudices, my silence, and my passivity. I want to repent ongoingly for the church's complicity in this historically, but also in the modern day. And then thirdly, I'm trying to resolve to make a conscious decision to use what power I have as a leader and that we have as a community with people who can influence and change things to share that power and to include others. Now, I know I have to own this. We have to own this as a church. It's our responsibility and it's going to take our commitment as God's people over a lifetime. And every one of us is going to be involved in that. This is not for people of color to lead on. It's for all of us to lead on equally as we are made equally in the image of God. As we defend and acknowledge and honor the image of God in each other, God is going to bless this church even more in the years ahead. And then fourthly, I've been trying to look how I can restore. Restorative justice. Justice has to restore. Repentance needs to lead to action. And I want to find as many ways as I can in my life and in our community to make this a place of healing and restoration for those affected by racial injustice. And you know, as I've prayed and I've thought about this over the past few weeks, I've sensed the Spirit of God speaking to me through a passage that, if I'm honest with you, he began to speak to me about Hackney Church about three years ago using these verses. I remember being at a prayer meeting when I just sensed there was this prophetic word for us as a church from Acts 13. And I want to come back to that scripture today. It's been something that I've been thinking about actually for about three years and have been waiting for a moment to teach into this. And this feels like the moment to share this prophetic word. So today is really part preach, it's part prophetic word. And I want to speak directly to each of us, whatever background we come from, whatever ethnicity, wherever we are today, whether you're in Hackney or the other side of the world, I believe God wants to speak to you today. So let's open our hearts. And in this passage, I believe God has some real encouragement for us. And so as we start, could we pray that God would use these words to release something powerful and prophetic in your life? And so why don't we pray together? Holy Spirit, would you lead us right now? I pray for every single one of us watching that you would speak to us that you would release the prophetic power of a diverse church, that as we gather together, even though we're dispersed remotely in the same Holy Spirit, that you would do a remarkable work in each of our hearts today. And all God's people, wherever they are, said, Amen. So turn with me, Acts 13 verses 1 to 5 says this, Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, who we know of as Paul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and there, and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, or salami, as I like to call it, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The prophetic power of a diverse church. Before we dive into the text, it's important to just understand the context into which this story occurs. So the Roman Empire, like many empires, made its business from controlling most of the known world. At the time the Bible was written, that stretched from Africa right up to the UK. Soldiers would have traveled from the Middle East to the UK. Uh, there were traders who, who went across the whole of the Roman Empire, but in each locality, the populations were pretty much oppressed under Roman rule. You had sort of basically um, token monarchs like Herod, who was not really in charge of the country. Instead, he was a tool for Roman oppression to keep people under control. So the Roman Empire 
divided and controlled people where they were. Then the kingdom of God comes along and breaks into this empire with another kind of kingdom that totally is the opposite. It's an upside down kingdom. Rather than God imposing command and control and division on people, Jesus comes and he conquers death. He breaks the power of division. He unites and empowers. In fact, the whole story of the New Testament is one long epic of heaven making good on the earth. People's backgrounds and ethnicities are not denied. They're brought alive in Jesus. Women are elevated to be equal than men, to men. They are, in fact, the first evangelists, the first people who see Jesus risen from the dead. The Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost is poured out on the equivalent of a United Nations meeting. Every tribe and tongue gathered. Babel is reversed. That's the moment when the power of God comes and it has an impact on all the nations. And then the, the story of Acts is these dividing walls keep breaking down. They're Jew and Gentile, now included in God's mission plan. Then the Holy Spirit speaks to Peter through a Gentile called Cornelius. And the Spirit is being poured out on these Gentiles. And the early church are like, wow, who are we to stand in the way of what God is doing? You know, one of the most fascinating things about our community here at Hackney Church is that we are part of worshipping in a place where it's likely that Jesus has been worshipped from the first century. You may not know this, but Shoreditch Church that I spoke about today on the broadcast is supposed to have been perhaps the earliest place of Christian worship in the UK. Why? Well, scholars think that the crossroads that Shoreditch Church is built on was one of the most strategic crossroads between the Roman camp in London and the north of England, where they had many strongholds, trying to keep the Scots north of the Scottish border. The Romans would have built a camp at Shoreditch because it was a strategic location. And it's likely that many of those soldiers coming through would have served in the Middle East. Scholars think that, in fact, it's likely some of the first Christians ever to have set foot in the UK. The first place Jesus would have been worshipped would have been at that crossroads at Shoreditch, where Shoreditch Church stands today. Just think about that for a moment. While this story is being played out, centurions and soldiers who'd perhaps witnessed the kingdom of God being poured out in the Middle East would have been rotated up to the northern ends of the empire and would have been living and praying and working in a place where we, as a church today, still worship. There's an extraordinary energy, a dynamism or a dunamis, if you like the theological term, that the Spirit is doing in the New Testament that messes with the containers of culture, with the boundaries of race. The Spirit is like, go, ends of the earth. But not only that, but what's fascinating is that what God does in that moment is to use people of real difference to bring about that empowering and that moment of explosion in the church. And in this passage, we see what is probably one of the most important prayer meetings in the history of the church. This is the moment where Saul, who up to this point has persecuted the church, he's had his conversion, he's encountered Jesus. But this moment, he's, he's not a kind of key evangelist or a, or a missionary apostle. He's just, just kind of running errands for the early church. He went to Jerusalem and they sent him back with a collection. At this moment, Paul is commissioned by the Holy Spirit to begin his real ministry as a church planter, an evangelist, a theologian, a writer. He wrote most of the rest of the New Testament. But this is the moment when the power of God comes on him. And at this time, we learn that some fascinating insights into the prophetic power of a diverse church. And what's fascinating to me is that Paul's commissioning doesn't happen in Jerusalem, where you might expect it to happen, where the HQ is, where ground zero of the Christian faith is, where the apostles are hanging out, where Peter is. No, it happens in Antioch, in modern-day Turkey, in a really cosmopolitan city, one of the largest cities in the area, where there's incredibly diverse gatherings of people from all around the world. And in this key trading city, there is one of the most diverse group of leaders you could imagine. And it's in that context that Paul is commissioned. 
Paul and Barnabas are prayed for by three prophets and teachers who lead the church in Antioch. And I wonder if there's something powerful and prophetic about this diverse church that we can learn from today, because I believe God is calling you and me to respond in this season. And I believe that we are going to hear from the Holy Spirit as we unpack this story and be expectant now for God to speak to you through these key individuals, three people whose stories can have a massive impact on your life today. The first story is the story of Simeon. Verse one, we learn a man, prophet, teacher called Simeon, who's also called Niger. Simeon or Simon had a Hebrew name, but we learn that his nickname was Niger, which literally translated means black man. In other words, this is a pretty obvious point, but he was a black man. He was not a Middle Eastern man. What we see here is a person of color prophetically brought in to lead the church to pursue true reconciliation from its very beginning. We see right at the start of the story that we are all made in the image of God, Jew and Gentile, black and white, whatever our background or our ethnicity, we all reflect the nature of God. Now, that may be pretty obvious to you, but theologically, this is really important. Not only do we have a black African man, but he's in a Middle Eastern city in southern Turkey leading the church. He's outside his normal comfort zone. He's displaced from where he grew up, perhaps, but he's a leader. Let me encourage you. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't belong or that you can't lead, or you can't lead a church because of the color of your skin or your story or your background. Don't let anybody tell you you can't lead because you don't look look like everybody else on the platform. Here is the proof that God loves a diverse church. In fact, God uses people of diversity to create incredible synergy in the kingdom of God. Without diversity, I don't believe we can see the radical power of God working in our churches in the same way. Not only this, and this is really going to blow your mind, but this isn't the first time we've encountered Simeon or Simon in the New Testament. I want you to think for a moment where you might have heard the name Simon before in the story of Jesus. Pop quiz, I mean, shout out the TV if you know the answer. Where have we seen Simon? Maybe in Acts? Maybe in the epistles? No. Simon appears in the gospel. In fact, scholars hold that Simon, Simeon, is likely to be the same person who was forced to carry the cross for Jesus on the way to Calvary. Just let that sink in for a moment. Here is a black man, not only the very man who lays his hands on the head of Paul and ordains him, commissions him for Paul's ministry who kickstarts the greatest missionary work in the early church that we've ever seen. But not only that, but those hands that are laid on Paul's head may have been the very same hands that carried the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, wow. You see, there's such power in a diverse church. God draws Simeon into his story twice. He felt the weight of the cross. He knew more than anybody the need for forgiveness firsthand. He literally had touched and carried and walked alongside Jesus on the way to Calvary, on the way to breaking down the divided wall. Here is a black African dislocated from his story and his people standing in Jerusalem, an eyewitness, a bystander, suddenly drawn into the drama of Jesus going to the cross to break down the dividing wall. He's an eyewitness. He doesn't run away like the others. But despite being an outsider, he walks with Jesus to the place of reconciliation. And those same hands are laid on the head of Saul, the one who persecuted the church, the one who needed to know that he was really forgiven. The very skin that had touched the cross now touches Paul's head. And Paul would write in Corinthians, you know, the message of cross, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It's the power of God. Maybe God needed Simeon 
to come from Calvary to Antioch to lay his hands on the head of one who'd persecuted the church, turn that life around and send it out. Is Simeon's gift that he imparted was forgiveness, the power of the cross, the power of God. You know, I wonder whether God might be speaking to you today. Maybe like Simeon, you felt burdened at times by the weight of your guilt and your shame. Perhaps you've had to carry a cross that wasn't yours, a burden that somebody else forced you to carry. Perhaps you've grown up feeling like you didn't fit in. And perhaps you have to keep forgiving every time, even when it hurts. Well, I've got extraordinary good news for you. God loves to use people who walk with him on the way of the cross to bring healing and reconciliation. Your hands that have perhaps carried burdens that other people put in them, they can be hands that release healing and forgiveness in the life of our church today. And I believe if that's you, Let the Holy Spirit empower you today. Let him speak to you today. The second person we meet, the second story I want to look at is a story of Lucius of Cyrene. Verse one again says, Lucius of Cyrene was there. This is a leader in the church, a prophet, but we know that he's from Africa. Cyrene is a town in Northern Africa. And so here's the second leader of the church in Antioch in southern Turkey, who's not from the Middle East. He's a prophet and he's from Africa. In fact, the biblical scholar F.F. Bruce even suggests the term of Cyrene might have been used for all people from the continent of Africa. So in a sense, interchangeable with of Africa. Another commentator puts it like this. This shows us the powerful impact and leadership of the black Christian diaspora right at the start of the story of the people of God in the New Testament. You know, for him, for Lucius, it would have taken courage and grit and faith for him to leave his home and be obedient to God, to serve God in a place that felt strange and different. People might have said to Lucius in Antioch, hey, Lucius, you know, you're not from around here. Where are you from, really? But instead, he decides to be obedient to the love of God. And in, as a result, this God uses him in the most powerful and radical and prophetic way to encourage Paul. I wonder, just like Simeon brought forgiveness, I wonder if God needed Lucius' his courage to impart that gift into Paul's ministry. That's the prophetic power of a diverse church. You know, I'm so grateful that we are part of a church that has many, many people who journeyed around the world whose story is one of courage and overcoming and bravery and refusing to be denied access when someone says to you, hey, you're not from around here. Where are you from really? With dignity, our church is full of people who smile and love and keep going. And I wanna say, I'm so proud of you. I know it's not always easy, but you are so brave and you lean in and you teach me what it looks like to love and be brave and courageous. And in itself, that is so prophetic and powerful. So I want to encourage you, if you're a person of color in our community, that you have a prophetic voice. Let that voice speak. Let your experience rise up and encourage each other. I want to tell you uh, one encouragement I got just last week from Fasayo who's one of our Connect Group leaders. And she is an awesome woman of God. And she, along with her Connect Group, are part of a key prophetic voice in our church. They're always meeting and praying and reading the Bible and listening to what the Holy Spirit's saying. And I got this email from Fasayo last week and I asked her permission to share this. Hello, how are you? This is a prophecy about Hackney and our church I had in 2016. The date and the time are written at the bottom of the email when praying. She had this prophetic word back in 2016, before Hackney Church had begun, before St. Luke's and John's got together, before Liv and I and our family were, were moving to Hackney. And this prophetic word in that moment 
speaks so clearly about what we are doing right now as a church, rebuilding churches, seeing things restored and, and God doing amazing things here in East London. And I want to share this with you because she sent it to me last week to encourage me, having sat on it for nearly four years. She says this, I'm encouraging you today. Do not be overwhelmed. This is a quote from the prophetic word. Do not be overwhelmed or doubt in the projects because they are the Lord's. His purpose will stand and he is using you and the team as his Nehemiah to rebuild his temple. The heart of God is love and aligning to that purpose pleases him. He is pleased with you for loving his prodigals, lost and saved. I don't know about you, but when I read that last week, I was so encouraged. You know, I spent my time in building project meetings and trying to work out how we rebuild these ancient buildings and build up the walls. But, but God has gone ahead of us as a team, as a church, and he's at the heart of this. And that's, that's for Sire listening with her group to the Holy Spirit. And then she ends this, the email. I want to share this with you because it made me laugh. Please, she says, rest in Jesus' finished word and literally rest. Brackets, you look tired on TV, smiley face. <laughs> Thanks, Messiah. You know, I found that so encouraging. I'm so grateful that we have a church that is so rich with leaders like Messiah, who are brave and step out in the prophetic, who bring their courage and their story and their identity to be part of the body of Christ, who aren't afraid to step out. Don't let anybody tell you that you aren't welcome at the table. You're called to lead. Bring your flavor. Stretch out your hand. Speak prophetically. When we do that, there's incredible power released in the local church. Then, the third person we meet is Manian. Verse 1. Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Again, he is fascinating. We're told he's been brought up with King Herod. That literally means scholars think he's likely to be in the foster brother of King Herod. A bit like Moses would have grown up with Pharaoh. The King Herod we're talking about is the, the King Herod who in the chapter before persecutes the church and in, ends up being struck down dead by God. But here is his brother from the ruling elite included and reconciled as one of the key leaders in the church. Now just get this for a moment. Here is a group of leaders displaced from their place of origin, but following obediently the call of God on their lives. And they are making their home, not in Antioch or Jerusalem or Cyrene, but in Jesus. And as a result of that, God releases his power in a radical, diverse way on an incredible group of people, people of color, black people, Middle Eastern people, people of vastly different backgrounds, working class fishermen like Peter, academics like Paul, the ruling elites like Manian, socially and ethnically diverse, united because they've made their home in Jesus. You see, that's our primary identity. It doesn't negate our ethnicity or our diversity. In fact, we come alive. You notice that these are not just Simeon, brackets, we don't know where he's from. Lucius, we don't know where he's from. Manian, we don't know where he's from. No, their stories matter and your story matters. You see, I wonder if God needed Manian to commission Paul, one who would have understood this that he had been adopted or fostered into a royal family. And now he was adopted into another royal family, God's royal family. While he was part of the elite, he now saw that his call and gift was to lift up and empower others from very different backgrounds. His gift, if you like, was inclusion. And he would have laid his hands on Paul's head as he perhaps would have watched his father lay his hands on his brother's head and commission him and bless him as somebody adopted into God's royal family. Paul later would write in Romans how we've not received the spirit of fear, but a spirit of sonship, of adoption, by which we cry, Abba, Father. You know, I wonder if you're like Menean, perhaps your family background is a little bit complicated. Perhaps people look at your background, they judge you. I think, well, you know, Herod, that's a pretty dodgy background. Maybe you've been ashamed of some of the story you've had to grow up walking in. 
Maybe you didn't know your parents. Maybe you spent your life living somebody else's story. And maybe today you find yourself in a position of influence or power or wealth or experience. Wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever your story, bring your whole person to the table because I've got good good news for you, God news for you. This is prophetically powerful. When you bring the whole of who you are to the table as you are, God will use you to release life in others. You've got a role to play. God is wanting to use your story, whether you've got a university degree or no GCSEs. God is gonna use your life to bring hope. You see, hope looks like this. It's radical, it's diverse, it's uniting, it's reconciling, it's an obedient church community, identified and living in the person of Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's a powerful model for us at Hackney Church. For our friends joining online around the world, this is a powerful statement for our churches that we are called to build a prophetic fire in unity, that each of us come and bring our love and our lives and the Holy Spirit will come and anoint that. And you know, I believe there's space as we worship and we fast to see God break through in this season. It's in that moment, in fact, a Simeon, Lucius and Manias and Barnabas and Paul are praying that God speaks and history is changed. And you can read all about the fruit of that in the rest of the New Testament. Church is planted, the dead raised, the spirit poured out. And I want to prophesy over your life today and over us as a church that God is wanting to do a new thing in you. The spirit of God is wanting to pour out on you, not only to unite us spiritually in a time where we're distanced physically, but he's breaking down dividing walls again. That's what Pentecost looks like. He's calling us to remember to breathe in the Holy Spirit and breathe out the love of God, to reach out our hands, to stretch out, to bless, to love, to travel from the places of our discomfort into the place of dependence on God. And in that moment, something begins to shift. The power of God begins to get released. Prayers begin to get answered. Lives and destinies get transformed. When you stretch out your hand, even if it's covered with the sorrow and the grief of your story, when you put that on somebody else's story in the power of the Holy Spirit, man, nothing can hold back the kingdom of God from flowing. That's what transformed those early Christians. That's what sent people out into the early church, even as far as Hackney in those early years of the kingdom of God flowing. I believe God wants to do that today. The same Jesus rose from the dead and walked among them. The same Holy Spirit that poured out his power in Jerusalem, in Antioch, in the ends of the earth, wants to do it in your life today. And I'm expecting today that God wants to fill you. He wants to breathe in your life, to ignite the image of God in you. So that as you bring all you are to the table, his power will be released and that you might see the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.